Good morning and hello everyone. I'm Nick Sladden, Head of Charities at RSM, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our webinar on managing risk in uncertain times. I hope you'll be able to stay tuned in for the full hour, um, and we have allowed about 10 to 15 minutes um, after the presentations um, where we can have a question and answer session. Um, so as we go through, please do use the Q&A function on your screens to submit any questions that you would like the speakers to answer. So in terms of speakers, I'm pleased to be joined by my colleague Liz Wright, one of RSM's internal audit partners, as well as Paul Eden and Gary Hockey from Gallagher. All three are risk, uh, risk specialists, and I'm sure we shall all learn plenty from their insights today. Um, but before I hand, it over, hand over to Liz, I just wanted to share my own thoughts on risk and charities um, and really give a little bit of a uh, history, or a personal history as to how I have seen uh, risk evolve in the charity sector in my time since the early 1990s. Um, so back then, I was a trainee accountant and I was um, getting to grips with the charity SORP 1995, um, which was the accounting standard at the time that charities were required to follow when producing their annual report. Um, and included in this was a requirement for charities to include a narrative in the front end of their report, in the trustees report, um, on risk and steps that trustees had taken to uh, mitigate any risks facing their charity. So around that time, back in the early 1990s, um, risk registers uh, were really appearing for the first time. Every charity had to do it. Um, and interestingly, at the time, I was working in the corporate sector as well, uh, and there was no such compulsion for corporate profit-making entities to do the same in their annual reports, um, as they were largely following uh, the Companies Act 1985. Um, so, so this risk um, requirement has been sort of fairly well embedded in, in the charity uh, sector for a number of decades now, and that's continued into what we have now for the, the Charities Accounting Guidance, SORP FRS 102. And as you can see, uh, the trustees report now must include an explanation of the principal risks and uncertainties facing the charity um, as, the, as set out by the charity trustees, um, together with a summary of the plans and strategies for, for managing those risks, uh, hence the theme of, of this morning's webinar. Um, so here's a bit of a generalization, but um, I think uh, risk is something that is generally done quite well by charities. Um, although, um, you know, cheaply posed the question, how many charities had the risk of pandemic on their registers back in 2019? Um, so when I first start speaking to a new charity, if I'm looking to become a trustee or to start working with a charity, one of the questions that I always ask is, um, can I have a copy of your risk register? And I think it's interesting that um, the corporate world has, has now somewhat caught up uh, with this requirement, and the Companies Act 2006 now has very similar um, disclosure requirements in it for, charity, uh, for companies to, to include risk statements. Um, and it goes as far as to uh, requiring entities to explain what those key risks are. So it's essentially very similar to what we have with the, the charity requirement. Um, so for me, the accounts are a good good place to start. Um, it, it's uh, in, in the public domain, um, but the risk register being an internal document um, and, and therefore a lot more confidential um, generally has a lot more detail around issues that might be worrying charity trustees. Um, so as a consequence, I find risk registers are, are pretty honest documents. Um, and if you want to know what a tr trustee board are worried about, uh, then it's a great place to start. And then, of course, it gets summarised in, in the annual accounts and um, the headlines appear in the trustees report. So what does the uh, regulator um, expect? So there is this um, compulsion in terms of annual accounts and annual reports, but actually there's quite a lot of guidance out there around risk management for charities. And the Charity Commission has its own publication, CC26, available on their website. Uh, which is a useful guide uh, for charity trustees to, to review 
and provides a good overview of everything that you might want to know about risk. So just really flagging um, its existence here. So I hope that's given a bit of an overview as to the um, sector perspective. But um, what are charities really considering? Um, well, RSM has carried out some extensive research into individual charity risk registers. And I'm going to hand over to Liz to explain a little bit more. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Nick. Um, so as Nick says, interestingly, pre-pandemic, um, no one had those risks on the risk register. But what we are seeing is a reinvigoration both of the overall risk management process and how charities review, uh, review risk in a more dynamic way. It's obviously been an incredibly challenging period, um, but it has heightened the awareness of what good risk management processes can be. Um, and also, obviously, you've stress tested a lot of those over the um, last uh, 20 months or so. So, um, but all the way back in Greek times, um, identified that change is the only constant in life and we see that also with risk registers um, they're constantly evolving and moving forward um, as Nick said we did some research over the summer with around 75 um, of uh, charities across the um, UK sector um, they were charities from England Scotland and Wales and also were of different types so different um, sub categories so whether that's arts culture and heritage or the health and social care and you might think that each risk register would be quite unique, but it was quite a lot of commonalities that we identified um, in terms of the types of risk um, that we saw in those um, risk registers. Um, but also I'm seeing how organisations talk about risk has changed. Um, it's definitely much more of a board focus now. Um, so historically that may well have been delegated to a subcommittee, but during the pandemic we saw that elevated much more to a board. Um, and also we saw much more regular updates to the board because it was such a fast moving um, risk environment that they were requiring much more regular updates. So pre-pandemic, we saw quite a lot of risk registers were relatively static um, because ultimately, if they're strategic, then um, just initial strategy changes, your risks may not change. Um, but obviously, the pandemic accelerated different elements um, and brought certain risks up onto the risk register. Um, we also saw risk appetite being much more widely um, talked about and used in the charity sector um, as they had to adapt to the unfolding situation. So those conversations have been a really good enhancement. Um, and as more boards have understood what their different risk appetites are in different areas um, and the need to change or stop or refocus strategy during the pandemic has allowed them to have those more um, risk appetite based discussions. Um, and also just the uncertainty of the operating environment. So um, when we get onto the detailed risks, you'll see that actually quite a lot of charities had unusually operational risks on their risk register. Um, and that as a result of the pandemic in terms of that interrupting that business as usual, that flow of um, activities, um, and also you know, pausing some activities, some new activities having to start. So the, that uncertainty created some change in the um, risk registers and what we were seeing. But there are some upsides. So. Um, as we said, risk appetite has been enhanced during this period, but we're also seeing greater um, adaptability by organisations, whether or not that's um, partnering with other charities to um, share back office functions or streamline costs or to deliver frontline services. Um, but we're just seeing organisations open up to doing things in different ways. Um, so you would have seen in the press that um, CIC, a large uh, charity in the north, has moved to a four day working week. Um, um, the obviously digital transformation of many organisations, the need for remote working. The RNID, for instance, is now a completely virtual charity. They have sold off um, the vast majority of their, their buildings um, and we're seeing that across the sector. So it's just this adaptability and ability to move more quickly than perhaps they have historically. Um, so those were upsides of the changes in the operating environment for um, due to the pandemic. So in terms of what we were saw as common themes, um, on the left hand side, we've got facilities and equipment and on um, moving forward through um, IT, unsurprisingly, um, factored both in terms of IT infrastructure um, and the digital transformation program, but also um, increasing risk around cyber, which I know Gallagher is going to touch on later. Um, but it's just that changing risk environment as we became more reliant on IT processes. Obviously, the risks around those evolved. 
Um, interesting laws and regulation, which didn't really change during the period, remained a um, key risk, um, as did workforce. Um, around 9% of the key risks included a workforce element. We're seeing that emerge now as a much more key risk, particularly in certain subsectors, um, such as health and social care. Um, and we expect that risk to continue to grow as a, um, a big trend in the sector. Um, business planning and performance was obviously impacted because Typically, organisations had historically taken a annual view on business planning cycles, but obviously that was very difficult to do at points in the pandemic. Um, and so we saw organisations perhaps reducing their business planning cycles to three or six months, um, but also um, starting to consider what that meant in the medium term. We've also seen... Um, issues around risks that are outside of organisations' control. So sometimes charities' risk registers can be relatively introspective, um, but what we saw due to the pandemic was obviously that, that, that gaining of a greater insight into what the external factors were that might influence the charity and its, the achievement of its objectives. So I expect that to remain on risk registers um, as we kind of move forward. Governance um, was obviously a key risk. You know, it's a key requirement of the Charity Commission um, and a key hot topic in terms of whistleblowing. Um, but ensuring that we could keep organisations safe, even when governance was perhaps self-adapting to um, virtual meetings or different meeting cycles or different access information. Um, and then unsurprisingly, the top two risk categories were around finance and operations and those the two um, that were kind of most impacted in the short term by the pandemic. Um, some charities did very well during the pandemic in terms of fundraising um, and um, income streams. Others obviously suffered um, as the switch off uh, around major fundraising events, for instance, um, was turned off. And as I say, operations um, actually was the largest category, um, which pre-pandemic we perhaps wouldn't have seen. In terms of some of the key risks, which we've touched upon there, but these are kind of the five that I'm speaking to most about with my clients um, and perhaps are creating the most discussion at board um, level in terms of how we're dealing with them. So the first is around economic uncertainty. Um, so some charities have seen falling income um, and don't necessarily understand when that um, income will switch back on. Um, and also we've seen significant changes to fundraising, fundraising strategy. So prior to pandemic, we were already seeing a shift in the sector away from individual giving to more corporate partnerships and philanthropy. Um, and that has continued. But obviously the switching off of those major fundraising events um, has, has had an impact. So what organisations were doing to react to that were um, a diversification of income streams. So looking at how they could perhaps diversify income where that was necessary um, and also key reductions in overheads. So as I said, many organisations I know moved to streamlining um, fixed assets such as buildings um, and the new ways of working have uh, enabled a different um, perspective around some of the, those overhead costs. Um, the impact itself of the virus. So um, some or many charities saw demand for their services increase um, and that hasn't abated. Um, in, and in fact, for certain types of charities, we expect that to continue over the next couple of years. Um, but obviously, they were, that was coupled with a challenge around operational de delivery, particularly those charities that had face to face services or, for instance, arts, culture and heritage. Um, obviously, it was a significant change in the way that they had to deliver their services. Um, but the organisational responses have been around, obviously, a greater move to remote working. Um, and new delivery models, be that more online exhibitions or interactive um, elements that we're seeing in some sectors, um, or just a general shift in the way that we do our services. Um, we've also seen across the sector a lot of people changing what they perceive as core for their charity, what their mission is, um, and understanding perhaps what those um, legacy actions that they used to take, which perhaps don't add as much value anymore. So I've definitely seen see charities look to streamline their um, strategies um, and in turn the way that they deliver their work. In terms of people, um, we've seen a high turnover. So since um, the summer, really, we've seen quite a lot of turnover at board level. Um, so whether or not people um, have uh, slightly fatigued um, at a very senior level. Um, and of course, the great resignation has seen a number of people refocus what they want from their own lives. Um, and operationally, sickness and absence rates continue to be challenging, as well as recruitment and retention in much of the sector um, has been very challenged. So we're seeing lots of organisational responses around engagement plans um, and also an increased focus on equality, diversity and inclusion 
and well-being agendas. So although they were always there in the charity sector, much more than some of our other sectors, um, there has been greatest, uh, greatest, greater focus upon that. Um, and also against the um, background of the Me Too and the Black Lives Matter movements, just a, a real focus on how we treat every single person who comes into contact with our organisation. Data security is a key risk. Um, we're seeing increased data breaches, mainly through phishing and cyber attacks. Um, and we've also seen a number of charities fall foul to fraudulent payment scams. Um, much of that was caused by a, perhaps a change in um, remote working, change in process. Um, but we're seeing, unfortunately, those kind of issues. Um, but organisations have continued to significantly invest in IT um, and have moved a lot more quickly than they may have done. Um, and also we're seeing um, a greater interest around fraud awareness training at different levels of the organization, both at board level, but perhaps some of the, your key um, purchasing areas such as IT or procurement. Um, so we're seeing a, a greater interest in those elements. And then finally, and probably most importantly at a board level is that strategy and long-term planning perspective. So it can be very difficult at the moment to agree what the medium and long-term strategy needs to be for your charity. Um, and underpinning that, what financial planning you need to do. Um, so what we're seeing is many organisations shifting to perhaps rolling budgeting processes um, and also a greater focus on cash flow and six month view rather than the longer term. So it's a bit of a balance between trying to make sure that the organisation can thrive in the medium term, but also that you've got enough short term view on cash and strategy um, to keep the organisation moving to worlds where it needs to be. So those are some of the risks that we're seeing. I'm going to hand over to Paul now at Gallagher's, who's going to talk you through um, perhaps some of the ways that they can help. Good morning, everybody, and thanks, Liz. Uh, so yes, as, uh, as, as Liz mentions, um, we're just going to um, talk through um, the impact on the insurance market, you know, what's going on out there at the moment, um, what you might expect to see, uh, and also what you can try and do to, to mitigate the position and improve the position as much as you can do. So as Nick um, mentioned, um, I'm Paul Eden. I'm Managing Director of the Gallagher Charity and Healthcare Division. Uh, I've worked, I've been in insurance since the late 80s, uh, but specialised in working with voluntary sector organisations and care sector organisations um, for nearly, nearly 25 years. Um, I manage a team of over 50 people. Uh, we're based out of uh, London and Birmingham, um, and basically have UK coverage for, for clients across the whole of the, the voluntary, and as I say, care sectors. Gary, I'll also introduce shortly. Uh, Gary uh, is a director of our division as well. Um, Gary's based out of London, specialised again in working with charities for the last 16 years, has got a huge amount of, of experience in um, working with organisations and talking to organisations that potentially um, are, are, might be new customers to us or, or, or where, where we're starting a conversation that we haven't previously had. So um, Gary's going to talk to us a little bit more about that as well. So just a bit about Gallagher to start with. We're conscious that um, you, you might well not know uh, too much about Gallagher. Um, we are actually a, a top four global insurance broker. Um, we're established in 1927, based out of Chicago, and worked with US, predominantly US based for, for quite a while, but then went um, global. Uh, we're now in 150, over 150 countries with 33,000 um, global employees. Um, and it, I, I'm conscious that, uh, you know, those are sort of some quite large numbers there, but, but what does that really mean for us in the UK? Um, so again, in the UK, we are one of the UK's largest insurance broker with over a million customers in a 75 branch network. Um, we're a Lloyds broker, um, placing over two and a half million dollars worth of, uh, of uh, premium into the UK insurance market, which gives us um, you know, significant leverage uh, on behalf of our, of our clients. Um, now, for those of you that um, may not know us, um, one thing that does often give um, a, a level of recognition is the fact that we are the, um, the sponsor of the Gallagher Premiership Rugby. So uh, if you if you see rugby on TV or go and, or go and watch games, then Gallagher is quite prominent in terms of the branding there. So it, again, that that's a I guess a bit of a, a bit of a reference. Um, okay, so um, us and charities. So 
based out of London and Birmingham, as I say, um, our expertise goes back over 30 years. Um, haven't quite been with it that long, uh, but I have been with it for, for 25 years. Um, and we work with around about eight and a half thousand voluntary and care sector organisations across the UK. And those range hugely in size and type, ranging from um, tiny local community groups, um, maybe an organisation that might only be buying public liability insurance for certain activities they carry out during a year, right up to very large, um, well-known national and international organisations, and certainly quite a few charities uh, for which there'd be quite a high level of public rec recognition about their name. Um, reference some aspects of the sector there, but really, our clients span the whole of the voluntary sector. The voluntary sector is clearly extremely diverse, um, and our client base uh, represents that that as well. Uh, and for us, it's about um, understanding our clients. Clearly, you know that sounds like quite an obvious thing to say, but but it's absolutely crucial um, that any broker that you, that you're working with properly understands the diversity of the organisation and what it does and its direction of travel. Um, and for us, that that's a key part of our approach. So the insurance market, um, what have we seen? What are we seeing? Um, what, what sort of impact is it going to have on you? So um, I'm, going to, I'm going to talk a bit about what we call the hard market, insurance hard market. Um, and we, we haven't seen a hard market for um, probably close to 20 years, um, but we did start to see that through coming through during 2020, 2019 to a degree, 2020, and then that was projected forward even more so um, last year. Uh, so it's not just about COVID. COVID has impacted it definitely, but um, property rates have been um, reducing and gradually reducing um, over the past 20 years. And for lots of organisations, um, possibly leading up to 2019, in some areas where, where claims hadn't impacted and where they hadn't particularly changed size, they might well have been seeing insurance premiums reduce um, over a number of years. Um, and, and property rates particularly had become effectively unsustainably low um, and insurers were starting to see um, significant losses impact. Um, not all of the losses are going to be UK based because insurers in the UK underwriting UK risks have reinsurance behind them. And so whatever the reinsurers are, 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 are being impacted by um, does equally then often flow through to um, what, what we pay in the UK in terms of our, of our direct insurance provision. Um, hurricanes, Dennis and Cara, uh, in January, February, uh, January and February 2020 impacted on that. Um, We've also seen uh, COVID claims. Now, COVID-19 uh, as a business interruption insurance um, wasn't picked up by most policy wordings, um, but there are some globally that, that did. Um, and a lot of those risks went through the London market, particularly where there were sort of fairly individual and bespoke risks. So um, the, the last reckoning was that the London market's going to be hit to the tune of around about 4.3 billion uh, for, for COVID losses. Um, so reinsurance costs are increasing, as, as I say. Um, investment losses. Um, so years ago, and certainly when I came into insurance, um, and probably for, for quite a few years after that, insurance companies could generally run um, their underwriting process uh, up to a level where actually they were they were not really making much money. You know, we, we call something a combined operating ratio, which effectively is all costs compared to all, all income that insurers receive. And they could... Run, run at sort of very high 90s and even 100% because they were getting investment income off the premiums um, that they held, but uh, rates are as, as low as they have been, or low as they've been for um, hundreds of years. Um, and so insurers um, now need to look, re look at um, making an underwriting profit um, rather than being able to rely on certain levels of investment to, to, to help um, their income levels. Um, something called Ogden. Um, Ogden was a review that, that took place a few years ago, and it was a it was a, a review of liability reserves. So, for people say who have had a life changing injury, um, uh, and a, a sum of money is set aside if there's a liability claim, a sum of money set aside as damages. Um, basically, Ogden and the outcome of that meant that insurers had to put much larger funds aside. Um, 
for a long term, things like long term care or uh, long term assistance to anyone who has been impacted by an injury that that is a result of um, the fault of another party. It might be a motor claim, could be an incident at, at, at work, lots of different scenarios. Uh, so that's meant that insurers have had to um, put more into the pot, basically. And Solvency 2 um, changed the basis that insurers had to um, were allowed to reserve and levels of solvent, solvency margin that the regulator required them to retain. So all of those were contributory factors. Uh, so what do we mean by a hard market? Well, uh, there's, there's an explanation there. So uh, essentially, insurers are reducing the amount of cover they're willing to write. Um, it's, it's off the back of underwriting losses over a period of time and insurers change their stance. So effectively, premiums increase, um, insurers become more selective on risk appetite. They only consider better quality risks. And in truth, in, in some areas, insurers adopt a bit more of a take it or leave it approach. Um, they have a price and a rate that they need to achieve. Um, and we also see reductions in, in cover um, and withdrawing benefits and being more challenging on claims. So it's just it's just a more a more difficult landscape. Um, those risks that are claims free, um, you know, we'll we'll see less of an impact of that. But some risks where they have experienced claims or from an underwriting perspective, they offer a challenge. Um, certainly, we'll see more of an impact of that. Um, so in terms of of driving. The best outcome what does it mean and and what are we seeing in different areas now where are we up to right now so um property and business interruption um again referencing the previous point we are seeing rates increase they have increased quite a quite a significant amount in some areas over the past 18 months as i said not just related to covid it's impacted but there are a lot of other reasons behind that um kind of a bit of a perfect storm coming together actually from from that perspective um, organisations that occupy premises that represent um, a level of challenge, so things like construction, um, you might be a charity with, with a relatively um, straightforward activity, you might even have just an office, but if it's if it's got composite panel panelling on it um, and that's going to cause insurers an issue, then you're going to see an impact um, of, of that. Um, we're generally seeing um, Average increases of around about 10% in the, in the property and business interruption arena, um, but but um, certainly higher, again, where claims are a feature or where aspects like construction um, are also uh, going to impact. One thing that we do see as well quite regularly is organisations maybe not having considered their business interruption exposure um, adequately. Um, sometimes the basis of cover may not have been reviewed for, for quite a while. It might have just rolled over. Um, and maybe some activities haven't been refactored in, in terms of could we lose money if um, certain scenarios impact us. Um, so, yeah, that, that's just a, one that certainly we see quite regularly when we, when we look at a, an insurance programme for an organisation maybe that doesn't, doesn't work with us at the moment, um, is maybe that hasn't been challenged as much. Um, the public liability arena is relatively stable. Um, organisations that are care sector focused might start to see um, COVID exclusions on public liability. Um, so if an organisation effectively was sued because of, um, and, and this is probably quite relevant, more so relevant to, to care organisations, but if they're sued because of um, a perception that they've been negligent how they've managed COVID and um, if it's a care setting, say it might be the, the family of someone who's been impacted um, by COVID, uh, we're starting to see increases and limitations in cover on public liability insurance. Um, the other aspect around um, public liability insurance is abuse cover. So claims arising out of an accusation of abuse, there are quite differential ways that insurers treat that depending on the consideration of, of exposure, whether an organisation maybe represents what's classified as a higher risk exposure, um, might be treated differently and sometimes um, from a technical insurance perspective, that can be, that that requires very careful dovetailing of wordings to make sure that gaps aren't created. Again, that's something that often you know we we do see. Um, DNO directors and officers liability or trustee indemnity. Um, there is uh, certainly far reduced cap capacity in this area. Uh, insurers um, when COVID hit last year, particularly were concerned about um, seeing lots of claims come out due to insolvency of organisations. And so they're um, looking increasingly at, at far more information. And this is a feature that, that you'll see, is that you'll be asked for far more information in advance of renewal 
than maybe you have been in previous years, particularly around financials, around trustees, um, around um, things like uh, whether whether any trustees have, have um, experienced any issues in their own sort of personal business life as well. Those are all factors that, that have, lots of those have been there, but certainly insurers are really drilling increasingly into those areas. Employment practice liability, we're seeing um, we have seen an uptick, and, and again, it's another area where there's an expectation that things like allegations of wrongful dismissal, particularly when organisations came off came out of uh, having staff on furlough, um, there's a perception that you know, those are going to rise. It, they haven't risen quite as much as were expected by insurers in recent months, but they, they certainly feel there's more to come down the line and that we haven't really seen yet the full impact of, of that. Regulatory investigations as well, we are seeing... Um, we've seen more charity commission investigations uh, across certain areas. Again, that can impact on this area of cover. Um, there's an expectation as well of, of more uh, of, of more investigations coming down the line from aspects such as HMRC, health and safety executive uh, as well. So the HNSE, like lots of organisations, um, haven't been based externally, they've been working from home. Uh, as those have started to get released, there's an expectation that they're going to start revisiting maybe some scenarios, site visits, and that we might see uh, increasing HNSE in investigations as well. So again, that's another sort of aspect that's impacting in this area of insurance. Um, employees liability, that's pretty stable generally. Um, you have to make sure that the definition of, of, of employees includes volunteers as a charity. That's pretty standard, really. Um, but that, that's an area that we haven't really seen too much in the way of rating increases, but, but one that's really impacted and has been and is really a, a, re, is, is a movable feast, definitely, is, is cyber insurance. So um, probably two or three years ago, cyber insurance was, was pretty cheap to purchase. Not, not that many organisations were, were purchasing it at the time. Um, and we are having discussions with our clients, you know, quite a way back. But again, it was sort of seen to be a bit of a nice to have rather than something that they, they need to have. Um, that landscape has changed significantly. And, and the conversations we're having with clients now, certainly they're more receptive to, to um, purchasing cyber insurance. And we're now positioning it ourselves as one that it's not, not so much now a nice to have. It's one that you do need, definitely. Um, and should be really high up there in terms of consideration because it's the area that we're seeing increasing activity in terms of cyber cyber breaches. Charities being targeted. Um, one insurer, Hiscox, has actually come out and said that at the moment they're not prepared to underwrite risk, cyber risks for charities uh, in, in isolation um, because their experience has been quite significant in terms of breaches impacting charities. Charities, um, rightly or wrongly, um, potentially are sort of perceived by cyber criminals as, as, as a sort of an easier um, access, maybe but potentially maybe that um, security might not be quite as good as it might be with other organisations. That, that's a very generalisation statement. I, I understand that, but that, that's kind of a perception. But also you tie that in with lots of charities hold lots of personal data. Um, and so that, that's attractive as well. And we've seen some quite significant uptick in, in volume and some quite large circumstances, uh, certainly this year. Um, so the, the market's cha challenging. It's challenging for all organisations, but but it's also challenging uh, to charities. Um, it's important um, to to make sure that um, you're alive to this. I think uh, one of the key things is to is to start the, the insurance renewal process early. But it's really just about making sure that um, you're you're considering. And your broker's talking to you about considering you know, what, what those risks historically look like, but, but what they look like going forward. And, and cyber insurance, again, just to reiterate, is, is one that's really changing and, and one that we're seeing um, very regular changes in stance from insurers on. Um, the recent, most recent being multi-factor authentication and requirement for that. Um, so um, that's not too doom and gloom. It's not. It's not in, intended to be. It's just to give you a bit of a snapshot. It really is a snapshot of, of sort of what's happening out there. Um, and now I'm just going to hand over to Gary, who's going to going to pick up from there. Thank you. No, thanks, Paul. Um, no, I've I've always been proactive, engaging with, with new charities. Um, I mean, this year has been a record year in terms of us kind of winning new business um, with many charities approaching us for advice. So. Um, I thought it'd be useful to share some experiences. Um, Paul's mentioned 
quite a few of them um, just just on this slide. Um, but one thing I'm seeing a lot of is, is many of the current brokers aren't actually being specialists in the charity sector. Um, Paul mentioned before, um, I mean, a, gen, a genuine specialist is, is worth its weight in gold, especially during these times. Um, I'm seeing also large premium increases. I mean, on risks that, that have not really grown in size or they have a good claims history, prices are going up, as Paul's mentioned before. Lots of changes, um, insurer changing their terms, conditions at renewal, um, in particular seeing additional COVID exclusions applied, not just under the, uh, the business interruption section, but, but under the management liability section, um, and more pre predominant for the care sector, but under the public liability section as well. So um, please keep an eye out for that. Cyber liability, again, summarising what Paul said, I'm, I've been seeing a lot of um, insurers now not even offering renewal if um, MFA, multi-factor authentication, is not in place. So um, really important to, to, to think about that and um, engage with UIT people in-house um, because chances are come renewal or even if you're looking for, for new insurance on cyber, um, you, you may not be able to get it without the MFA in place. Um, another area where, where I've, I've, I've been doing my reviews is, is the abuse cover, which, which Paul mentioned before as well, and um, it's not a nice subject at all, but um, a very important extension. Um, I mean, many charities that I've spoken to over the years kind of didn't really know what cover they had in place for it. Um, so whether it was actually in place at all, um, if it's not, it could be a potentially very serious gap in cover um, if, if you haven't got the abuse extension under the public liability. Um, another area um, I'm seeing a lot of at the moment um, is the employment law advice, um, especially following furlough or redundancies, um, any staffing issues. Um, there is actually an extension you can have under your management liability, which is known as employment practice liability. So again, a number of charities, some of them actually had that cover that I've spoken to and um, not, not used it. So and they're, they're paying for this service and uh, didn't know it was an extension. So um, another area which I think can be really helpful, especially in these times. Um, another area which is becoming more common is, is the, the, the need to engage with risk management experts. Um, so whether that's um, health and safety audit, audits or COVID and other risk assessments needed, needing a fresh pair of eyes over, a competent person service, so it's all something we can offer at Gallagher. Um, we have a full experienced risk management team that can get involved and help. Um, another area I don't think Paul did mention actually was the, the kind of um, changes in the way we work. Uh, there's a number of premises that perhaps unoccupied or at least have diminished usage. So if that's the case and, and a building has, has changed, the activity has changed at a building, you know, it's very important that the insurers or your brokers are aware of what's going on because there, there will be a condition within the policy. So if there are changes and the insurers didn't know and that the claim come to light, there could be um, there could be some issues with that. So that's another area I've, I've been, been, been working on with, with charities. Um, and business interruption, finally, is another area where, yeah, there's, there's been um, some cases... Yeah, loss of revenues covered for far too much or, or none at all. Um, additional cost of working extensions have, have been quite light. Um, and also where charities have perhaps been um, receiving rent, um, we've not seen that covered under that section. So there's, there's, there's lots of work. But um, all these areas that, that Paul's mentioned, I've just summarised on. I mean, they're, they're all picked up within our free review that we offer all charities um, of all sizes. So yeah, please feel free to contact us and we're, we're happy to, to help. Okay, thanks, thanks, Gary. And uh, I think yeah, Liz talked about aspects that are high on um, charities' agendas um, from a risk management perspective. And I think you could see how so many of those feed into everything we're talking about here uh, from an insurance perspective. You know, it's risk management, it's mitigation, but it's then what happens if the worst does happen? How how robust is the insurance going to be? So thank you, and I'd like to just hand over to Nick. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Gary. Um, and, and thank you, Liz. Um, so we've got a bit of time for some questions, and we've had a good mix of uh, questions that have now um, come through for the panel. Um, and uh, the first one is one that I can actually take. So uh, the question is, um, is there an equivalent to uh, the CC26 guidance that I mentioned in my, my initial comments um, as applying in England and Wales through the Charity Commission. But, but uh, the question is, is there an equivalent uh, published by 
the Office of the Scottish Charity Regulator, Oscar, uh, for charities in Scotland. Um, so, uh, in terms of a, a sort of wide ranging um, uh, um, guidance that is produced by OSCA, there, there isn't really anything that is particularly equivalent to the CC26 um, guidance that is published. Um, OSCA instead um, does, however, um, have uh, some, some really good specific guidance, particularly around uh, financial risk management. Um, in the areas of uh, cyber uh, uh, as well as fraud. So um, if you look at the Oscar website, you'll, you'll see some quite sort of specific areas that are considered and, and some really good guidance that is published. Uh, but what I would say is that the CC26 guidance on risk management um, is really very, very widely applicable to any charity and any not-for-profit organisation. Um, and it does cover all areas. And, and if you delve a bit deeper into the CC26 publication at the back, you'll see, uh, and, and throughout, there's some really good examples. Uh, there's some model uh, examples and, and templates as well, uh, which might be useful if you're, you're trying to sort of come up with your own uh, risk management framework uh, for the first time. So it's a well worth a look at. It's, it's not just um, a, a publication that is guidance. It does have some sort of practical uh, aspects to it as well. Um, I think the, the second question almost sort of flows on from that, which was, was around tools and templates that are available. And I'll, I'll just direct uh, this two-part question to, to Liz, if I may. Um, so the question is, um, is there any advice on how best to use um, departmental operational risks to feed into an overall strategic rest register? Um, and then secondly, how should we develop or review an overall charity strategic risk register? So if I can throw that one to you, Liz, please. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the best approach is the two-prong approach. So we see a bottom-up risk register approach, i.e. looking at more departmental or divisional or operational risk registers, um, and then rolling those up to a top-down approach, which is around the board identifying what its key risks are to the strategic objectives. So you may well find a meeting in the middle. Sometimes we will have operational issues which are bubbling up at a board level, um, but having that kind of clear grassroots process and a top-down process gives you the whole benefit of a rounded approach to that. Um, there are plenty of um, tools and templates and we can share some of those after. I think my experience of risk management though is there is a, no such thing as a perfect system or a perfect register. It's much more about how do people use it to drive decision making and how is it used as a really helpful um, tool for the board to understand how the risk profile is affecting many other areas of the organization. So I think sometimes we can get hung up on what does perfect risk reporting look like or the perfect system, but it's much more actually around the culture around it. Um, you know, how we use it, how often it's updated, how people view it. Is it a bureaucratic process? Is it actually something that's live and dynamic and people feel bought into? So the risk register is one part of that, but actually the whole kind of culture around it is much more um, what we see as effective in organizations. Great. Thank you, Liz. Um, I've got a free um, advert for you here, I think, Paul. So um, I can direct this one to you. Um, so the question is, where would I find a list of insurance brokers suitable for charities? Thanks, Nick. Um, yeah, from uh, so ha hello, Connor. Um, yeah, well, Connor, we're very happy to have a, have a discussion with you, um, you know, from, from that perspective, um, I guess from, you know, from the um, the conversation and the, the the presentation we've done, you can see our sort of credibility in, in the sector. Um, so we're very happy to have a discussion and see if there's something we can help you with. Thanks, Paul. Um, so another question for myself, actually, which was, uh, Nick, do you see any poor examples um, of uh, risk statements in, in annual reports? Um, so, so what I would say is this is probably sort of in two areas in terms of an answer. So. Um, one, one bad example that I see is um, when, when looking at annual reports is that uh, the, the narrative and the description of the risks that I, I'm reading in that document um, doesn't necessarily match or follow what I've already seen in terms of an internal uh, risk register. So there's an in inconsistency really between what's being said um, internally and, and in that first draft of an, of an external report. 
Um, so that would be the first one. The second one would be um, really just, just poor practice of um, simply rolling forward the risk statement uh, from a previous year's annual report into, into, the, into the current one um, and, and not updating it and, and making it a, a true reflection of, of the year in question. So, so that, that's probably the two areas where um, I do see um, some, some poor examples. Um, next question I have um, is around um, MFA, multi-factor authentication, which Gary mentioned. Um, so the question here is from, from um, a charity. Since we don't uh, currently have MFA, uh, does that mean we might struggle to get cyber insurance? Um, what would be our options? Can you offer any practical uh, tips? Uh, so if I can throw that one to you, Gary, please. Yes. Um, yeah, no problem. Thanks, Nick. Um, what I'm, I've been seeing over the last few months are insurers applying a, a condition at renewal to say that MFA must be in place in order for them to, to actually invite the renewal itself. So what, what brokers can do um, is go to the market, which is quite limited. Paul mentioned earlier, Hiscox were a, a big, big insurer for the liability for charities and, and recently have pulled out. So the market is becoming a little bit more limited. Um, my, my ultimate advice is, is during the pre-renewal process, which, which should be carried out three months before the renewal date, is just um, have you, you can't brokers should have that on, on the top top of their agendas to, to speak to you about um, and start engaging quickly with your IT to, to ensure that it's in place. It's, it's mainly for staff that work remotely and log on remotely. Um, that, 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 that's where that, that's, that's, that's needed really. Thanks, Gary. Um, a question here, no one, for, I think, for Liz. So um, uh, I'm hearing some suggestions to remove uh, risk registers altogether and replace with alternatives. Um, have you uh, come across any more on this? Um, and have you heard of any possible alternatives that might be out there? So as an auditor, can I just say it makes me a bit nervous when people are talking about removing risk registers because I think we've spent a long time trying to embed them. Um, we're seeing various moves towards more dynamic risk reporting. So whether or not that's enabled by more system solutions, um, obviously heat map reporting, exception reporting, those types of things. But most of them are underpinned by a risk register format. Um, and I like to think of the risk register a little bit like your general ledger. You wouldn't send that to the board and be like, here are the accounts. You know, the risk registers are kind of working tool that you capture core information that you then extrapolate at extrapolate and make meaningful so we're seeing lots of evolve like evolved thinking around what's that information extrapolation like and how do we present it for boards so it's useful but there's still a kind of core process underneath to kind of underpin it through a risk register but perhaps not sending those as the full document as we perhaps saw before um is where we're seeing organizations move to Thanks, Liz. Uh, next one might uh, be another one for you, Gary, which um, is um, how much should there be a refocusing of risk management to be, say, less about identifying specific risks or areas of risks and, and more about the sort of general resilience uh, that, that is it within the organisation? So, um, you know, is the charity being is the charity capable of responding to, say, sudden um, realisation of, uh, of an unanticipated and, and unique risk? I've done some work this this year, well, over the years, where I've, I've introduced our risk management team, um, especially when talking to our clients and charity clients about business interruption, it's quite key when we ask about the business disaster plan in place. So um, we've, we've, we've fully advised. That can answer lots of questions. That can help us educate us on, on how to advise on the business interruption section as well. So it's very, very important that, that that's in place. And something that where I've introduced uh, at Renewal is quite common where... Perhaps if I see an area where, where a charity needs some assistance, then I've been speaking to insurers and actually negotiating bursaries on top to ha perhaps pay for an expert here at Gallagher um, to go in and, and almost help update or rewrite the business disaster plan for, for charities. Thanks, Gary. Okay, Next one. Um, um, it's a bit of... Sorry, Paul. I was going to say, so, so, so coming to that and Kevin's point about do we see a risk registers then then yes you know, obviously you know a risk register can be can be a huge document and what we're then doing really is having the the conversation with the, with a charity to establish you know what are the key risks and some, some present themselves to us as an insurance broker as very obvious 
you know, they have a building, they own it, it needs to be insured. But it's really getting into um, a much deeper conversation than that, understanding what their contingency plan will be. Um, and then particularly when we start looking at areas, you know, we, we referred earlier to things like management liability and the position that trustees are in, in terms of, of um, the, the roles and responsibility and those sort of things that keep them awake at night. What, what's insurable, what's not, what's transferred, what advice can we give? As Gary mentioned, you know, from a risk management perspective, what else can we do to overlay their own activities in this area? So, um, and it, our direction of travel is, is very much about, and, and for us as a broker, but, but us as well, in terms of us positioning your needs as a charity with insurers, is those, those organisations that can present the most co cohesive um, consideration of their own risk are the ones who are going to uh, come out the other end from an insurance perspective in, in a much better shape. Um, so I think it's, it's it's really important. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Gary. Um, another one for you, Liz, um, which is, um, did you find in your research any more charities recognising the risk associated with the board's ability to make robust decisions, i.e. Uh, board diversity um, and the board's own ability to take risk? Yeah, absolutely. No, we saw a big shift um, around considering board diversity um, and most organisations um, seeking to do that either through the next round of trustee appointments or quite successfully co-opting um, different people onto boards or working groups to give that perspective, to avoid that group think. Um, actually, the move to virtual board committees um, has been really helpful as well about opening up the pool. Um, so traditionally, obviously, many organisations held board meetings in public, often in um, the south of the country. Um, and actually, they found that like, the move to the virtual just meant that they opened up that pool. Um, in terms of some of the themes we're seeing, many organisations now are considering the golden threads that run through some of their risks and their issues um, and thinking about whether or not those are things like resilience, whether or not it's about um, decision making processes and how robust they are and um, the overall governance or program management. Those seem to be the key things that have come out. So I think the good thing is we're starting to look at risk as a whole, um, as a profile, rather than just trying to manage individual risks in their own right. Thanks. And, and we've got um, just one, one final question now, um, which um, is, sorry, Liz, it's not one for you. Um, what, what should I be looking for um, to constructively challenge uh, any risk reports that I might be looking at as a trustee at board level? I think as a trustee, your primary role is to triangulate the information you're getting from numerous sources and challenge where you feel the risk register is out of step from that. So that may be from when you're doing walk arounds, that may be from some of the information that's presented at certain subcommittees, it may be the papers that are brought to the board. But if that doesn't ring true to you about what the key risks are of the organisation, either the risks on your risk register are wrong or you're talking about the wrong things at board meetings. So it's just trying to get that triangulation and parity between what do I think are the core issues that really are going to stop the charity achieving its objectives? What's going to make this organisation fall over? That's really what needs to be dealt with at board level. And other elements which are much more operational need to be elsewhere within the governance structure so that you get assurance as a board member that they're being managed, but you're not necessarily in the detail. I think over the pandemic, we saw many boards dive into the detail because they needed to be. Um, and obviously the operational situations were moving at such a fast pace. However, we now need to kind of elevate the board back up to where it needs to be to be focusing on those strategic risks. Thanks, Liz. Uh, some useful insight there um, and tips for the future. So I'm just going to draw the uh, Q&A session to a close. So thanks to all the attendees that did send in uh, questions. Um, if you did have any further questions, um, then you'll see our contact details um, on this slide here. Um, and just to let you know that we will be sharing the slides uh, later via um, email. I appreciate that on some of those, there was a little bit of detail on the slides that may not been um, particularly visible, but when you get those on email, you'll be able to see um, much in a, in a much clearer way. Um, we will also be providing uh, access to the recording of uh, the event this morning um, for any parts you may have missed or, or for any colleagues that, that may have missed the entire um, webinar. Um, so do, do look out for that in your in inbox. 
Um, you'll also see on the slides here, we've just included um, some, some uh, links to um, the, the reports that we've been mentioning um, today, uh, which um, I hope you'll, you'll find uh, useful. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed um, the seminar. Um, to ensure that you receive details about future RSM events, please do um, use the links here um, where you can update um, your preferences. Um, but finally, I'd like just to um, thank you for making it this far. I'd also like to thank all of my fellow speakers and just to take this opportunity to flag our next event on the 9th of February, um, which is about maximising property potential and protecting property assets in charities. And we're doing that in association with the property experts, Gerald Eve. Um, so in the meantime, I'd like to uh, thank you for participating. Um, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day.